Our fans at Alabama demand so much, expect so much, but get so much uh, because they want to be uh, associated with a winning team, whether it's football, basketball, gymnastics, softball, whatever. And so it was always fun for me to be around those fans. Hello and welcome to the latest edition of This Alabama Life, a series in which we highlight uplifting, positive, feel-good stories from people who are associated with or from Alabama to sort of counter all that bad news you're hearing out there, the pandemics and politics and all that sort of thing. Uh, Andrea Tice is with us. Andrea, good to see you. It's good to be here, Don. You could probably tell, well, maybe you couldn't. I, I'm wearing my crimson uh, shirt, and I got plenty of white hair to go with it, so crimson <laughs> and white are sort of the themes for today's program. Tom Roberts, a name and a face most of you, I think, would be familiar with. Tom, it's great to have you. Good to be here, Don. Glad to glad to see other old uh, guys watch from it, uh, watch radio. It, watch it. <laughs> <laughs> In the spirit of full disclosure, I probably should mention Tom uh, actually not necessarily hired me because they didn't pay money at the Crimson White, the student <laughs> newspaper. Goodness. But as I, my first day on campus, I walked into the offices there at the uh, Union Building, and Tom happened to be in the office, and I said, I'd like to write for the Crimson White. He said, can you write? And I said, yes, and he took my word for it. He said, I want you to write a column about the team that the football team, Alabama and Bear Bryant, are going to play this weekend. I said, great, where do I get my information? He said, well, I got a couple of uh, their media guides here, but most of them, you're just going to have to go find the stuff. And that was pre-Google, by the way. Yeah. So you couldn't just go look it up. So I had to crank out something. Half of it was made up, but uh, <laughs> at least we got a column and a half filled in the paper. Tom was the sports editor for the Crimson White. Yeah. And then later, Tom hired me along with uh, Bill Davis to, uh, wow. to go across the river on Tuscaloosa Radio from WJRD 1150, Top 40, to WNPT, <laughs> down on the river playing that adult contemporary music. If it uh, had too much of a beat, you couldn't play it. Couldn't play it. No. Quality radio, it, WNPT. Well, exactly. And you also had to go to work in a boat sometimes <laughs> when the right. river flooded. <laughs> So anyway, and you had to watch cows coming in the back door. We had that at WJRB, too. Yeah, out of the, we had okay. to go out to the transmitter sometime, and you'd look up, and a cow was sticking its head through the door <laughs> at the pasture where the uh, the tower was. You can tell we're old. Yes, absolutely. I'm sure that happens today, right? Of course. Tom, it's it's great to talk to you. We're, we got a lot to cover, and, of course, you and I are both in mourning because of uh, what happened most That's recently right. in the national championship game, but we're awfully proud of the, the Tide and how, how well they turned out. When did you decide... You know, you, you, you've had the, the job everybody wants. You got a chance to work for the Crimson Tide Sports Network, the radio broadcast, the coaches' shows, all that sort of thing. When did you decide, first of all, you wanted to go into the media? Was it radio? Did you want to be a disc jockey? What was the story? You know, I, I grew up in Fayette uh, over in West Alabama, 3,707 people when I, was, uh, when I was in my young years. And I guess I was 12 or 13 years old. And I was listening to the radio, and it was WWWF in Fayette, Alabama. And uh, I thought, that just that sounds neat. And uh, so I started, and you may have done this too, in my bedroom doing a radio show. And uh, thankfully, a few years later, I uh, took English when I was a junior in high school from Margaret Black, who was the um, best teacher I ever had in my life. She taught me how to, uh, to write, and she also was married to a guy named Jack Black. Uh, Jack was uh, the manager of WWWF and also the owner of the Fayette County Broadcaster, a little weekly newspaper. And Jack needed a proofreader, and Margaret recommended me because I was a pretty decent studi student, and I went to work for the newspaper. And... Uh, was a proofreader, wrote a column called TR on TV, by highlighting the things that were coming up that week. On all on both channels. That's right. That's Well, at that time, you're exactly right. Channel 6, Channel 13, there was no 42. Sometimes on a good day, we could get Channel 4 from Columbus. Columbus. But Jack one day said, Tom, would you like to be a radio announcer? And I 
I said, does it pay? He said, yes. And I think it paid $1.35 an hour, which was minimum wage at that time. Oh, wow. And uh, so he, he allowed me to work weekends. I would come in Saturday at 10 in the morning and work till sign off because it was a daytime only station. Sunday morning, I got there at sign on and stayed till sign off. But my mom said, if you're going to work, he's got to let you go to church. So every Sunday morning about 10, Jack would show up at the radio station. He'd man the board until I got back around noon. At any rate, that's what that's how I got my start. And because I, in high school I played football, I was the official scorer for basketball. I played some baseball. Sports was just always a part of my life. And so somewhere along the line, they kind of uh, intersected. I went to the university after I, I guess I worked for Jack for three years. And one of those years, I did high school football on Friday nights. Not live. I had to tape it. Play it and back on play Saturday it back morning. On Saturday morning, uh, <laughs> and a part of that, I'll just as an aside, we did it on a big old cart machine, like sixty-minute carts, uh, and you had to erase them. Well, one Friday night, I was in a hurry and didn't erase it, and so I was recording over my recording from the week before, and at oh eleven o'clock when I got back to the radio station, I stayed until about two in the morning recreating part of the broadcast. That, would, that would have been two games for the price of one. <laughs> That's right. Perfect. I don't think the advertisers or Jack would have appreciated that. At any rate, I, I went from there to Tuscaloosa, student at the university, and uh, as you noted, got a job at uh, WNPT, uh, where they let me work with Russ Chapel, who did Tuscaloosa County High football. And I did that for, I guess, three years, and then uh, Bert Bank and his son Ralph called and said, could you come to work at WTBC? Well, at that time, Bert was the owner and general manager of the Alabama Radio Network. And uh, so I thought, well, no, this could be my opening. And uh, so I went to, to TBC. I uh, was the news director, the uh, sports director, and the program director for the FM. Mm -hmm. Bert, Bert uh, didn't believe in paying well. But you got to do a lot of work. You were a starving college student That's who right. wanted to be in radio, and he took advantage of he that. He took advantage of it, exactly. But at any rate, uh, during the time I was there, I did Tuscaloosa High School football and basketball and um, did the Jimmy Sharp radio show every week. We'd record it on Wednesday night and mail it out first thing Thursday morning to as many stations as the state in the state that wanted to, to carry the show. So at any rate, that's how I, I got into the door uh, with Alabama as, uh, as well as just sports in general. You know, you mentioned that you were uh, pre-taping those games mm -hmm. and then putting them out the next yeah. day. So you're watching the game? You're oh, yeah. watching the game on TV and you're just kind of... No, no, no. This was, uh, we were going out to, to, we did Fayette County High School, to Fayette, to Winfield, to Carbon Hill, and we'd sit in... Sometimes in a press box, sometimes in, in Vernon one evening, I sat on top of the press box and, uh, and called the play-by-play -play Oh, okay. and, uh, and okay. recorded it and, and had a good time. It was fun. I was, I was a student at the university, so on Friday afternoon, I'd haul it to Fayette, do a football game or to Winfield or Vernon or someplace else and do the football game. And then go back to, to Tuscaloosa that night. And you can only hope that you could get the uh, lineup for the visiting team right. or the other team. Uh, yeah, number two is the quarterback, and uh -huh. he throws it out to number 27. Number 27 but, is tackled. You know, I, I, I wanted to always be as accurate as possible, but I learned very early on that the folks who were listening in Fayette, Alabama, didn't care didn't about care Winfield. Less about Winfield's quarterback. They, if I got his name right, that was a bonus. <laughs> and they didn't know either. So, but yeah, you're right. You, there was not a whole lot of advanced scouting or advanced work for that matter. Yep. Uh, I, I did uh, Little League play by play in Aniana on <laughs> yeah. 1570, right over next to the glove box on mm -hmm. your radio dial. <laughs> and uh, we didn't have lineups for either. Team, we didn't, they didn't even have numbers, so I'd say, you know, okay, a little redheaded kid's back up. He got a single back in the first <laughs> inning. No joke. With the little league, you're exactly right. 
Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's got to that's got to be tricky because they they all look the same out there with their yes, helmets and right. everything. That's and, exactly and their mamas right. want to hear it done right because they're uh -huh. sitting there with a little transistor radio tuned sure. to 1570. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, at what point did you say, you know what, I can make a living around this stuff? Well, you know, while I was at the university, uh, I was fortunate uh, to work for Burt Bank, and Burt was so well connected. Uh, I didn't make a lot of money, but I made enough money to think, this is something I want to do for a living. And at uh, one Christmas holiday, I actually went to Selma, Alabama, and worked va va holiday relief for a guy named Julius Talton. Mm -hmm. And Julius was one of the pioneers in radio in the state of Alabama. Well, I worked for him for two weeks. I uh, lived in the YMCA, and, then, and I don't remember how many hours I worked, but I was having a ball. And uh, a few years later, I'd gotten married, and this was 1970. Uh, Julius came to Tuscaloosa, and he said, Tom, uh, I like you. I, I, I think you got a future in radio. Why don't you come to work for us in Selma? And uh, sooner or later, uh, I'll buy another radio station, and I'll give you a percentage of that. Well, at the same time, Bill Davis, whom you mentioned, Bill was working at Channel 13 in Birmingham. Bill called and said, Tom Wendell Harris would like to interview you for a position in, uh, at Channel 13. Well, I went home, talked to my then wife, and uh, she was not in favor of going to Selma. So we, we wound up in, in Birmingham. Gary Fuller, who you may remember, in, uh, was in Selma working for Julius. And uh, sooner or later, Gary... <coughs> Um, well, Julius bought a radio station in Opelika and gave Gary, I guess, 50% of it. Well, in the past, I don't know, seven or eight, ten, maybe 10 years, Gary sold those radio stations for millions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, And he's also the mayor of Opelika. So, <laughs> so I may have made a mistake uh, and not taking Julius up, but then again, I could have been living in Auburn, and that wouldn't have done it. Yeah, all. that wouldn't have gone over uh -oh. well at no. all. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I don't think people realize. Now, you mentioned some legendary names there. Yep. Burt Bank was WTBC on yep. that station. He was part of the Bataan Death March. Yep. He survived the Bataan Death March, and uh, he would have made a great guest for this program. He's no longer he with us. He certainly would have. Yes. Wendell Harris, uh, legendary newsman, news director, anchor, um, just to work with some of those folks had to be a thrill. Though. It was a thrill. It was not necessarily a thrill working for Bert. Mm. Uh, Bert and I later became wonderful friends. I mean, he really did, but Bert was a screamer. And he'd come in in the morning at 6 a.m. and scream at me for doing something wrong. But five minutes later, would come in, and I was his best buddy. I mean, he really was. He was a... A, a really wonderful guy. He didn't interfere with how we did the job most of the time. Uh, he hired us and he screamed at us, but basically he, <laughs> he let us do what uh, what we could do. Yeah, plus it was a fun job. I think uh, if you if we had had uh, ratings in Tuscaloosa at that time, TBC would have been like 95%, especially on the university campus. Especially, yeah. And we I worked at WJRB, which uh, was trying to be a top 40 station, but Every morning at 7.45 in the middle of drive time, they had sold a 15-minute block to a local store, who and they let us they made us play Guy Lombardo music oh my goodness. for 15 minutes oh, in the no. middle of morning drive. <laughs> but it was about the only revenue they had, that's so what right. are you going to do? <laughs> and that's it. You know, and, and Bert had so many wonderful, wonderful guys that worked for him. John Cochran, who went on to be a, a great newsman for NBC, um, Alan Burns, who was a, a a legend in the radio business. Yeah, got me so my many. first job in Birmingham. Oh, really? Yeah, I worked part-time, and I, I took Alan's part-time job at oh, WVOK. Well, Bert didn't pay us much, but he let us have fun. He really did. And uh, there's so many legendary stories. When I wor worked for Bert, Courtney Hayden mm -hmm. was the overnight announcer. And Courtney, a great guy, but Courtney called me every morning at 4.30 to wake me up. <laughs> and if he had not done that, I would not have been. To make the sure station. the guy shows up at 6 exactly. o'clock. That is a exactly. true friend. Absolutely. Uh, 
Well, you know, a, a lot of our uh, podcast viewers and listeners may not know some of these people, but, you know, James Spann uh, went Trump. through WTBC mm-hmm. as a long-haired, uh, what, 16 years old. He was still in high school. He was still in high school, exactly. But a lot of great disc jockeys, a lot of great radio personalities, and a lot of people who went on to other things like you did. Yeah. Now, you came to Birmingham. You did television. You were news director at uh, NBC 13. Mm-hmm. Um how was that? That was an interesting time. It was after the civil rights thing, so mm-hmm. it was a little different situation. It was after the civil rights uh, era and all the happenings during those days. And uh, uh, Carl Daniels and Truett Evans were the first two African Americans I ever worked with. Carl Daniels had that great voice. Oh, wonderful voice. Wonderful voice and a good guy. Uh, but I, I came in uh, as... I, I, don't, I guess Carl had been at the TV station maybe a year or two before I got there. Uh, but it was, it was a great time. We had so much fun. I mean, we really had fun. We worked hard. Uh, but I, I can remember uh, that I was uh, one of those people who spliced film together. And, and young people now have no idea what that is. But I, I went from film to videotape to ultimately in the final years of my broadcast career uh, with computers. You actually had live feeds maybe by then? Uh, yeah, by then. But we didn't have them <laughs> early on for sure in 1972 when I came to Channel 13. Uh, but we had a, and I, Wendell uh, liked me, and I, I think it was because I worked hard for him. Uh, and so uh, I progressed from um uh, the late night news anchor. That's the way I started at 11 o'clock because at that time, Channel 13 was NBC and CBS. And so they could carry an extra hour of network programming on tape at 10 o'clock. So I followed the untouchables at 11 o'clock for the late news and nobody ever watched it. Uh, But that also gave me the freedom of I could make mistakes and nobody really cared. Nobody screamed and yelled at me. But it was, I went from that to covering City Hall. Uh, I, I covered City Hall when, oh my goodness, Nina Miljanico, Russell Yarbrough, Richard Arrington, some of the great names in Birmingham history were in part of their career, maybe not early in their career, but uh, certainly uh, a, a part of b- moving Birmingham forward. And uh, that was a thrill just to be around those people because they were, they were characters. Uh, it was a it was an era before they were so careful about what they said, and so sometimes we'd get uh, really good comments from them. But uh, I was the city hall reporter. I would go in and cover the council meeting, keep up with it, and then we had a little studio about like this uh, off to the side where we'd bring the mayor or Miss Nina in and interview them uh, on film. So at any rate, I, I, that's what I did next, and then uh, became assignment editor, went off into sports for a few years, too, uh, working with, uh, with Herb Winches when he, he and Joe Langston came over from Channel 6, and then ultimately became news director. But in the midst of all that, uh, in 1979, the summer, Charlie Thornton, who was uh, the sports publicity director, but also Coach Bryant's chief advisor, Uh, I got a phone call from Charlie, and he said, Tommy, we need somebody on the radio network to get scores to give to John Forney and Doug Layton to work during the broadcast. Would you do it? And after I got up off the floor, I said, yes, and I never even asked if they'd pay me. (laughs) No, you have to pay them. (laughs) That's that's about right. (laughs) But uh, they actually did pay me, I think, $50 a game and paid for me going on the road, and I would sit on the telephone and uh, listen to uh, some voice in, uh, in uh, New York doing scores. And I'd, you know, if something interested to me, like the Vanderbilt-Tennessee game or something, I'd hand it to John, and he'd read it. Well, a couple of three late years later, I started being on air and doing the scores myself. They'd come to me for that. So that's that's the way I work myself in the door at Alabama. I was going to say, getting that foot in the door is so important. It was in amazing. media, and you got to. I mean, you have to sweep the floors. I mowed grass whatever. at radio stations. That's I'm exactly telling you. it. You know, you do, whatever it took, you did it. 
And, uh, you know, I, I sat at a corner of many a press, press box booth and uh, had the phone up to my ear trying to keep up with the game because I wanted to see if Alabama was going to win, which the Tide did almost every time back in those days. Uh, but my job was to give them scores. And uh, so it was, a, it was a way to get in the door. You're exactly right. Do you remember the first Alabama football broadcast, maybe? that I remember listening to Maury Farrell, mm-hmm. who play-by-play. I don't remember if there was a color man or not. Yeah, Maury Farrell was the play-by-play, and John Forney, I'm pretty sure, was, I know the, he was, uh, for a while. was yeah. the, uh, the color analyst, I guess you'd call him. For some of our listeners, just yeah. help uh, clarify the difference between play-by-play and being a color okay. commentator. Well, play-by-play, and, and to make it uh, current, Eli Gold is the play-by-play broadcaster for Alabama, and he is the main guy on the broadcast. Uh, he's going to describe everything that's going on. And when he finishes describing a play, uh, John Parker Wilson, who's the color analyst, comes on and talks about what made the play a success or why it failed. And so that's the difference. Uh, and typically now it's going to be a former player or a, for, a that's coach. Right. Or, that's or exactly because it. Because they want them to have that expertise that – some of the other ones didn't have. Didn't I, necessarily, yeah. Doug Layton was one of my favorites. <laughs> Doug Doug and I did radio together for yeah. a year. It's the longest year of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Doug was a character, I'm oh, telling you. A major character. But yes. he loved Alabama football mm-hmm. more than anything. And Did you get a chance to work with uh, – who were some of the folks that you worked with? By, John Forney was one of the greatest human beings I know. He and I got to know each other very well in his very later years. He – People don't realize he was in New York in the early 1950s Mm -hmm. uh, doing television. And there was practically no television in New York City. He helped invent the medium. Mm. Then he comes to Birmingham and starts the ad agency, Lucky Forney, which is still there. And yeah. Uh, but he he had he want, he had written a book about his memoir of those times in New York, and he also had written a detective thriller. And, I didn't uh, know that. And I put him in touch with my agent, my yeah. literary agent. I'm a writer, mm-hmm. and uh, they were actually trying to work on some things, and uh, that's when he passed away. Passed away. John was one of the best guys I've ever known in my life. Uh, first of all, because he was good to me, uh, he he allowed me to do almost anything I wanted to do as as far as the broadcast was concerned. But John was uh, the best storyteller I've ever known. Uh, he And his, his stories were always elaborate. Uh, there was no such thing as a 30-second story with John. And that's why I knew he'd be a good writer. Well, that's it, you know, and except when he was doing the broadcast. And then he knew that he had to you know, to 10 to 15 seconds. And Doug was going to come in usually with some funny story. Doug was not what a color analyst would be today because I'm not sure. I love Doug Layton and he was one of the funniest men I've ever known, but Doug was not known for doing a lot of homework, (laughs) which you have to do in a broadcast. And John did, thankfully. Uh, But they were a, a great combination on the air. They really were. And, uh, when Ray Perkins came along, Ray decided that uh, John was too old and uh, a young guy named Paul Kennedy was hired to take John's place, which irritated a lot of folks, to say the least, including some of us in the broadcast booth, uh, because we had gone through John having a stroke and had uh, had done everything we could to make the broadcast better. But at any rate, uh, Paul Kennedy came along and Paul and I became very, very good friends and still are to this day. Paul uh, encouraged me to be more on the air of doing uh, scores, the halftime show and that kind of thing. But he also recruited me to be his color analyst on the Alabama basketball broadcast. And we had a ball, just absolutely had a ball. And uh, worked with Paul. Paul was uh, it, it just a, a consummate professional. Um, he did his homework every step of the way, and just a, a great guy to work with. Now, did Paul have any previous affiliation with Alabama? No, none whatsoever. Was he the first? Not only when the first play-by-play for Alabama sports started, do you have any idea? Well, Or Auburn, either one. Yeah, the, the, the play-by-play for Alabama started in the 50s, um, and I— That's when I remember Maury Farrell, and he yeah. was a homer. He yelled and oh, screamed yes. and— 
you better be a homer if you're going to do the Alabama vodka. But yeah, he was. Then John, Paul Kennedy came along, and Paul was more uh, the objective guy. He got excited. I, I, the, the most famous Alabama call of all time was when Van Tiffen kicked the field 1985, goal. North yeah. End Zone, Legion Field. That's right. Time running out. And P- Paul Beat Auburn. painted the picture vividly. And then when the field goal went through, he said, it's good. Doug said, it's good. They went back and forth five or six times. They didn't say it that way. It's good. Yeah, that's right. It's they good. were screaming. They were screaming. And it was just, but that, you know, that that's what I think people want that are Alabama fans are listening to the Alabama broadcast, and they want the announcer to be excited. Um, after, after Paul left, uh, John came back for a year and was really not the same at all. And about that time, uh, Tommy Limbaugh hired Eli Gold here we, to here, do the what basketball here? broadcast. You go out and hire a Yankee who does <laughs> ice hockey and NASCAR. And NASCAR. Yeah, it made no sense at all. And well, still, obviously it didn't work out. No, not, not at all. <laughs> Only, what, 40 years later, right. Eli's still doing the broadcast. Uh, and it was, you know, I went through those, those changes uh, when Paul took over for John. Lots of fans were really irritated because they loved John Foreman. They really did. And uh, when eventually John decided to give it up because his health had just, it, he was not healthy enough to do the games. But he was still healthy enough, thankfully, to work with me on the pregame show. And that's where his storytelling came to the front. Because I could say, well, this afternoon, John, we're playing uh, Arkansas. What do you remember? What's your favorite story? And he could go off. Three and, hours later, and oh, it's yeah. time for kickoff. Exactly. Now, let's go to the booth. <laughs> exactly. So he, he was a wonderful, wonderful man to work with. Uh, Eli took over after John, I think, just worked one season after uh, coming. In. And I'll never forget, uh, after Paul was uh, left the university and John came back, the very first game, Doug introduced him, and John says, before I was so rudely interrupted, <laughs> and, and then went ahead and did the broadcast. But at any rate, uh, when Eli came along, it took a while for folks to get used to him. Uh Eli is the consummate professional when it comes to homework. He is going to go into the broadcast booth with every piece of information he could find about either team. And uh, so it, he it, that, that really helped him because he'd really not done football before mm-hmm. he started doing Alabama football. But he had a gift for seeing what's in front of him and describing it. And, uh, and still has that gift. He's still uh, just doing a wonderful job today. And well, until he decides he doesn't want to do it anymore because he's that entrenched now. Uh, but uh, he, and, uh, he also has the, uh, the able assistance of a guy named Tom Stike. Uh, Tom has actually been with uh, Alabama sports as far as broadcasting for almost 40 years, long, even longer than Eli has. But Tom is the engineer and the producer uh, whose goal in life is to get us on the air, on time, get us off the air, on time. But in the middle of all that, keep everything level as far as the announcers and, and the crowd noise, but also to whisper into Eli's ear information that only Tom has. And uh, Tom is also responsible for some of Eli's great post-game lines of uh, the roses are crimson when we beat Texas. Uh, Tom, I think, suggested that to Eli. Uh, And Eli realizes that. uh, that There are several things about Eli that he cannot do a broadcast without Tom, but also a guy named Butch Owens. Uh, Butch stands behind Eli every broadcast and is his spotter. It's Butch's job to find out who made the tackle and to point Eli has a big spotting chart in front of him with all the numbers and names and point who made the tackle. Uh, so there it's, it is a true team. Eli is no doubt the star of that team, but uh, there are so many other people who contribute to the broadcast and, uh, and Eli realizes that, uh, you know, he's, he'll be the first to tell you that, uh, 
he couldn't do a game without all those people around him. Now, one of the other things you have done is the coaches show. Yeah. That half hour recap. Or it's about <laughs> an hour, I think, at, at times. Well, it? it was back in the day, days of Coach Bryan and Coach Jordan, it was an hour. Uh, Coach Bryan was on at four o'clock on Sunday afternoon, and Coach Jordan was on at five o'clock. For Auburn. For Auburn. And, and in those days, you didn't have as many television uh, games. So on f- Sunday afternoon was the first time a lot of people saw the highlights. And because there was not there, the Tide and the Tigers were not on TV that much on Saturday. It was, it was okay to do an hour of highlights because you literally could show almost every single play. Uh, and they did and did such a, a wonderful job. I mean, it, pro football was coming on the scene. Of course, we didn't have a team in Alabama, but nobody really cared about that. At 4 o'clock, they knew Denny Chimes was going to start ringing on the air, and it was time for Coach Bryant's TV show, uh, Coke and Golden Flake. Coke and Golden Flake, which yes. uh, came through, of course, uh, the agency, Lucky Forney, Lucky where John worked. Yeah, and and Forney did the show with Coach Bryant for a long, long time, and then uh, Charlie Thornton took over and did it. And uh, so it was just it was a, a wonderful one hour. Uh, Coach Bryant would kind of mumble his way through it. A lot of those things are on YouTube now. You can yeah, actually are. see them, and it always got me that they would be showing the greatest plays in the world, and Coach Bryant would be saying, well, it was good to see Mr. and Ms. So-and-so That's drove right. up from Troy to watch their boy play, mm-hmm. and uh, I got a good restaurant down there, a good barbecue <laughs> place I go to, and the plays are spinning off. You know? That's it, you know, and people didn't care. And then all of a sudden he would say, boom! Ooh, that's a goodie. Or bingo, yep. that's a was, goodie. It was yeah. a big hit or an interception <laughs> or something like that. It was fun to watch. Right? It was fun to watch. It really was. But after Coach Bryant, it uh, I think TV stations really didn't want to carry an hour on Sunday afternoon. Uh, so it, it became then a 30-minute show. And uh, Ray Perkins, uh, I don't remember who did the show with Ray Perkins. Maybe Gus Hergert. Uh, but at any rate, Bill Curry came along and Bill did the show by himself. Uh, then when Coach Stallings came along, by that time, uh, the the rights to everything had long since passed. Yeah, before that, everybody worked for the university, right? Did, no. they, own the, did they own the shows? or they, they No, it was always an independent thing. Uh, Bert and Texaco actually owned the radio broadcast for years and years. And then... Frank Taylor, who had an advertising agency here too, Frank, I think, owned the Coach Bryant show. But by the time that uh, Coach Perkins and Coach Curry came along, the, uh, the, the, the company that owned the broadcast rights owned the television show as well as the radio. And uh, that came in, gosh, I can't remember when Kirk Wood and a, a company called Collegiate Sports Partners got the rights in 1992, I guess it was. And um, Kirk, thankfully, was the one. I I had uh, left Channel 13 by that time and spent two miserable years at uh, WERC Radio. Uh, and Kirk rescued me from that. That's in Birmingham. For That's those here of in Birmingham, around the state. yeah. Yep. Um, there are some wonderful stories from those years. But at any rate, Kirk hired me full-time to be the producer of – the radio broadcasts and the TV shows. And for the for a couple of three years, I actually anchored the TV show. I was the, the host with Coach Stallings. And um, some wonderful times, of course, some great, great teams. Then uh, Jeff Rutledge took over, and from there it just kind of became somebody else, and I became the producer of the show, uh, which still meant I had to, with Coach Stallings, get up and be in his office about 6 a.m. on Sunday, which was not – not much fun, especially after a night game. But that was also the time where you get to talk to the coach. Uh, when when we would get there to start, we, we did the show literally in his office. And when we'd get there and start setting up, uh, Coach Stallings was watching video of the game from the day before. And so you'd occasionally get his, into a conversation with him. Uh, and most of the times those were pleasant conversations uh, until after a Vanderbilt game where uh, we had a kick blocked. Uh, they had a fake punt that was successful, and I always took him a sausage and biscuit, and I gave it to him. And 
He said, well, thank you. I said, well, it'll taste good, but I'm not sure it's going to make your special teams look good. Well, he, he didn't appreciate that, <laughs> let's say it that way. And, yes, uh, Tom, we noticed that, okay? <laughs> he fussed at me, yes, to say the least, but he also was kind of like Burt Bank. Um, coach would could fuss at you, I mean, scream at you, and then five minutes later, everything was fine. And so, thankfully, that was the case with, with the coach after the special teams, and I don't think I ever again uh, criticized his teams. Of it. At least the In special teams. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you've gotten to work with some amazing people. Yeah. Uh, coaches, athletic directors. Uh, do you have favorites or you, do you want to name favorites? Like, yeah. you know, what, who's your favorite well, kid? Definitely athletic director is my favorite is Mal Moore. Uh, Mal was such a good, good guy. Loved the University of Alabama. Grew up in the small town of Dozier down in South Alabama, or Doge, as he would call it jokingly, but just a wonderful man who always, I thought, did what he thought was the best for the university because he loved it as much as anybody has ever loved it. Uh, so athletic director, uh, Mal would be my favorite. Now, he did a big favor for Alabama. Wasn't he, didn't he, the, isn't he the guy that hired Nick Saban? That's exactly right. I mean, he, it, and it's, and it's weird how, over the course of time, little bitty things, additional pieces of information have come out about that. Just in the last week or two, uh, I, I found out that Mal had a nephew who was a realtor at Lake Burton in Georgia who knew Saban. And that was kind of the first, the way that, that Mal initially got in touch with, uh, with Saban or with Jimmy Sexton, his agent. Uh, but it, yeah... Mal, at first, wanted Steve Spurrier, and Spurrier said, no, there's no way. Uh, then he actually hired Rich Rodriguez from West Virginia, and I think Rich's wife finally decided, no, we want to stay in West Virginia. So at that point, he went back to his he, – he'd always – and, and it's, it's strange how you can remember things uh, – LSU – had the by far the best recruits, the best talent in the SEC at the time that Mal was became athletic director and Nick Saban was their coach. And so Mal always, always admired him for that ability to get the best talent. So it became in you know a situation where after Rich Rod decided to go back to West Virginia, Mal had to do something. And so he really zeroed in on making Nick Saban the head football coach at the University Kept of Alabama. Kept out on his lawn pretty much, didn't he? Pretty much so, yeah. Not quite, but he became friends, and Mal was such a wonderful Southern gentleman. Women absolutely adored him. Well, he used all of that skill to charm. basically court Terry Saban. The wooing that's yes. Saban. <laughs> and, and he did. I mean, it, she was, she is truly the reason why uh, Nick Saban. I don't think she likes South Florida. No, she didn't care for it. She didn't care for the whole pro football scene. They truly were college football family. And so Mal saw that. Mal uh, used all of his charm on her and then got the, uh, the first meeting with Saban. And I, you know, Saban is a, such a smart, shrewd man. He knew, I think he knew, well, first of all, he just didn't really care for the whole pro football scene. And he knew if he was going to come back to college, he had to be at the best. Well, you know, the University of Alabama had a brand, maybe a big, well, no, maybe it's about it, a much bigger brand than LSU had at that point. And so that became an easy part of the sale. Uh, but Mal... Mal had told the, the pilot that, uh, of, the, of the university plane that took him down there, if I don't get Saban, we're going to Cuba. And <laughs> thankfully, he didn't have to go to Havana. We uh, wound up getting the, the, the greatest of all time. Well, as you're telling um, us about all the different uh, fellow sports casters, mm -hmm. athletic directors, coaches that you've interacted with, and you in a little earlier you were saying that you had a ball with – Different people. Yeah. What have you? Are you able to qualify what that is? That what clicks when you're you've got this kind of back and forth with a person that you're working with yeah. on air, 
And is it just their ability to, to know when to shut up and let another person <laughs> comment? What, what makes that click? Have you been able to identify that? Well, some of that is just what you said, knowing when to hush and let them talk and vice versa. But I think in, in the case of all the work with the university, uh, the fact that, number one, I love the University of Alabama and have been a fan since I was <coughs> nine or ten years old, that started the process. But then you, you learned early on who were the guys that, that shared that love but also were willing to work mm. to make, make it happen. And uh, I've been so very fortunate to work with so many guys down through the years, and and I shouldn't say just just guys because there were women too, but who who shared first of all the love for the university, but who also were willing to put in the work. Um, and I I I used to talk to to young students all the time, and the the main thing I tried to convince them is it's work, mm. it is fun. But you got to do the work to make it fun. And so I've been fortunate down through the years to work with some incredible people who worked so very hard at what they were doing. And um, and we had fun. You know, I, there are a lot of jobs in this world where you go to work every day and you might have a little fun. But if you're in sports broadcasting, there's a game you know, in, in football every week and basketball twice a week and baseball sometimes four or five times. Well, what could be more fun than sitting and watching and describing what's going on on the football field, the basketball court, or, or uh, the, the diamond and baseball? So all of those things together made it fun. And, um, and we also, had <laughs> so many, many times during, down through the years, so much laughter. Uh, and I, I think that um, some of the things that it might be wrong with our country today is that people are, you know, they don't laugh. They don't try to have a, have fun, have a good time. And uh, throughout my career, that's the one thing that we certainly did. We had a good time. The yes. only the only exception I can think of, if you're doing play by play for well, a team that goes two and ten exactly. every year. That's when you really got to work. Yes. When they're 11 and 0 or 12 and 0, then that's easy. And thankfully, because I, I, all my career I worked with Alabama, there weren't many years like that. Just the four years I was there, that was the worst. <laughs> but they were thinking about firing Bear Bryant because we were going six and five every yeah. year and losing the bowl game. It's amazing. You know, and it, that's the other thing that's made it fun down through the years, too. And at times, not so much fun is fans. Mm hmm. Uh, our fans at Alabama demand so much, expect so much, but get so much uh, because they want to be uh, associated with a winning team, whether it's football, basketball, gymnastics, softball, whatever. And so it was always fun for me to be around those fans. And um, they, they still make it fun today. I, you know, I, I've been retired, I guess, six years now. And I still will find somebody at a game who will say, aren't you Tom Roberts? And I, uh, you know, good to see you. Do I owe you, you money? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> you always worry about that. In my that, case, yeah. that's a pretty good chance. Yeah. Uh, well, we've talked a lot about Alabama. We don't have time to give equal time to all the other teams. But who, who, what play-by-play -play folks and color folks do you uh, have oh, you admired? Goodness. And who, who are your heroes there? Well, I think first and foremost on my list would be Larry Munson. Oh, yes. Uh, Talk such about a, a homer. Oh, ultimate homer. Ultimate homer. But Kirby Smart uh, channeled him the other night. I'll never forget listening. And it, I didn't listen live. I'd heard it later on on tape. Larry describing Lindsey Scott's long touchdown run. And at the end of it, Georgia had won. He says, they're going to be destroying furniture in Hilton Head tonight. <laughs> Well, the other, the other night, uh, in homage to Larry, Kirby Smart says they're destroying furniture here in Indianapolis tonight. But Larry was my favorite. My favorite was the we, we stomped their faces with a hobnail boot. boot. That was against Tennessee, which yes. is the one I always wanted to beat, beat more than anybody else. But it was so many. Uh, John Ward, who did Tennessee, was mm -hmm. a, a great broadcaster. Uh, Jim Fife. Well, going back before Jim Fife, Buddy Rutledge, uh, Gary Sanders. I remember Gary Sanders. That's one of the first ones, too. Well, and I had had the pleasure of working with Gary for a long time at Channel 13. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Jim Fife was outstanding. And it's after Jim, of course, is, is Rod Bramlett, who met it, uh, who, who was killed in that horrible accident, and now Andy Burcham. I've always, and I don't know that fans necessarily know this or would appreciate it, but the Alabama and Auburn broadcast crews have always been great friends. Uh, our engineer, Tom Stipe, always worked well with Larry Wilkins, who was the Auburn engineer. So that there's been a, a great deal of respect and, and some good times, some fun times, some laughs with uh, the guys from Auburn. I also admire Jack Crystal. Uh, Jack did the Mississippi State broadcast for better than 50 years. And uh, a, <laughs> a guy who uh, I smoked, and so did Jack. So we spent many a pregame at basketball or football outside the stadium or the arena smoking a cigarette together and swapping stories. And Jack was an irascible soul. Not many people could get along with him, but I always did. And Mississippi State fans absolutely loved the guy. He was wonderful. Uh, so they, there were so many. Uh, the the uh, SEC Network uh, did a, a an hour show called More Than a Voice that was all great, about. Great show. Oh, it was incredible. Just incredible. And uh, so there are so many that, that, have, that I've crossed paths with down through the years that I admired, and you know, I think the common thing that all of them had was they worked hard and they thoroughly enjoyed what they were doing. Now, for those of us, and every one of us, I think, at one point thought we would love to be a play-by-play oh, yeah. announcer. I did Little <laughs> League. I did a freshman Alabama-Auburn game when they played freshman uh-huh. on the little campus station at Alabama. <laughs> I thought, man, I did a pretty good job. I'll, somebody yeah. will call me up and offer uh-huh. me. Never happened. <laughs> uh, what's the hardest sport to do play-by-play for? Uh, to me, it's baseball because baseball is slow moving. You got to fill all that dead air. You got to fill all that time. Uh, Some guys, Eli, for instance, absolutely loves doing baseball um, because it, it gives you an opportunity to tell a story to, you know, it's, it's just laid back and easy to me. Basketball is the best sport to do because it's constant action. You don't have to necessarily think about, well, who am I going to talk about next? You just talk about what's happening on the court right then. And, and football is, is not the easiest, but it's certainly not the hardest uh, because it, it's, uh, it's, it's confined to 100 yards and you know, there's 11 guys on each side of the, of the field. So it's, a, it's, it's not the hardest, but it's certainly not the easiest that's, either. That's one reason I thought Eli would do a good job with Alabama because he did NASCAR. Can you imagine making cars going around and around in a circle turning left? Well, exciting on the radio. Yeah. And he did hockey. Yeah. Hockey may be the toughest because there's no stoppage. You know, it's constant motion. <laughs> and I will never forget when the Birmingham Bulls came to Birmingham and before Eli came. I had never seen a hockey game in Me my either. entire life. The very first hockey game I ever saw, Gary Sanders was doing the play-by-play, and I was his color announcer. Now, don't ask me, other than I worked cheap. You know? But then the second game was the next night or two nights later. Gary had to go to Auburn, and uh, Gary did the Auburn broadcast, and on the way home was listening to Dave Campbell mm. do the hockey play. Long time play. Birmingham folks oh, will yeah. remember Dave Campbell. Yeah, the, people the, the first speak. talk radio in mm-hmm. Birmingham. Exactly. Well, Dave had convinced Gary that he could do a hockey broadcast. Well, let's say that he didn't do a great job. At the end of his first period, somebody taps me on the shoulder and says, Gary Sanders is on the phone with you. Okay. So I go downstairs and I take the call and he said, Tom, you're doing the rest of the game, and Dave will be. Oh, wow. Oh. So first hockey game I ever saw, I was doing color. Second one, I was doing play-by-play, and I was so bad, I never did it again. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, it could only be uphill from oh, there. Oh, it, it is so fast-paced. Well, you know, you mentioned it. Every football game is on television now. Every yeah. college football game is on TV somewhere. Mm-hmm. If it may be streaming, but it, you can you can see it. Do you think there is going to continue to be a need and a demand for radio play-by-play? I think there is because there are, you know, first of all, I hear so many of our fans, and they've said this for years, back to the days of Forney and up through Eli, 
they turn down the sound on TV and they turn on the sound on ra- from radio. That's what I do. Well, it's not in sync, so you no. got to do some work. They make a radio, by the way, that you can delay right. and get them in sync. Well, you and you can certainly do it computer wise. Uh, so I think there's there people want to hear the hometown guy. Uh, Alabama fans want to hear Eli do the game. They could care less what Brad and Gary or anybody else on the broadcast have to say. So, yeah, I think there will always be. Uh, that, that's a connection. Uh, and I, I, I used to, one of my jobs with the uh, radio network was to go around and visit all of our affiliates in the summertime, and I, I loved that because it was going back to my early days. But I always told them, especially the ones who were doing high school football, uh, you know, you can't get high school football in Haleyville on TV, you certainly, you know, it's it's just the only way you can know how Haleyville came out that night, or Anianta, or uh, Andalusia, Springville, it's spring, you know, my all, town, all of those small towns. That's that's one way that radio has stayed alive. Although a lot of the schools now, are, they'll take a camera out and yeah. they'll stream the game. Mm-hmm. But that's one camera on. I I did that. <laughs> For Pelham football for three years. I did it for Thompson for a couple of years. Yeah. You've got one camera, uh-huh. and uh, you do doing play-by-play, and you, you hope the ca- that, that the guy running camera doesn't go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and then he has to shoot the band at halftime uh, because that's where most of the they would sell DVDs or exactly. tapes of the game. Uh-huh. And, and most of it went to the band folks. Well, you know, the, and, and that's a crude way of doing a telecast. But I think... One of the things that's happened over the course of the last now nearly three years of, of COVID is that people have been forced to do things that 15 years ago we would have thought, well, that's amateurish. I mean, how dare you do an interview with a guy on the telephone? Right. But In I your th- living room. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's now become accepted because of necessity. Mm-hmm. We actually do Zoom interviews here because exactly. it, people are, they don't necessarily need high def. <laughs> no, they don't. And it, you know, the, the other part of the technology is that I participated in a Zoom meeting this morning of a support group that uh, my wife recently died with uh, dementia, and I still go with a support group. And, uh, but it, it's, you know, it's what technology has allowed. I mean, this is, an example of what technology yeah. allows us to do. And, you know, I, as an old radio guy, this, yeah. this I remember we were trying to get the rights for to do the broadcast in Birmingham yeah. on our stations, and the, the general manager was not interested. He said, I just don't think anybody's listening to radio anymore yeah. for the Alabama games. Mm-hmm. I said, let's go out and ride around on a Saturday afternoon or a Saturday night and see how many people are on the road. Exactly. How many people are working shifts, especially in a town like an uh, industrial town like Birmingham at right. that time? Uh, you know, that 10,000 people out at TCI. Exactly. And they can't watch television. Uh-uh. They're going to listen to the game on the radio. That's the beauty of radio, right? It Absolutely. frees up your hands. You All you have to do is rely on your ears. And that's the importance of a radio uh, broadcaster is to paint that picture with that's the right. words so that, you, you know, you're not relying on the visual. And painting the picture truly is what Radio broadcasting is all about of a sports event. Now, here's and, the question. Do you miss it? You know, I, I You're don't, retired now. I don't miss the work because, frankly, during football season, it was seven days a week, 70 hours a week. So I don't miss that, but I do miss the people, yes. Uh, and thankfully, I've been able to remain very close to Eli and to Tom Stipe, uh, and we talk once every week or so and uh, try to get together for lunch Sometimes that's difficult with their schedules. But, yeah, I, I don't miss the work, but I do miss the people, yeah. I can't tell you what a thrill it is to have you with us today. Well, to I hear thoroughly these stories. enjoyed it. And thanks for hiring me to, for nothing <laughs> to do that crimson white column and to go across the river to WNPT and do the – I did afternoons, and I think I left you in the lurch a lot because they would call me to come to Birmingham to work on the big station in the big market. I remember that, And yes. I'd call Tom up like it uh, – <laughs> One thirty in the afternoon. Tom, we're not coming to work today. And I bet Tom had to sit down and do the show, I guess. Yeah, but that was all right. That was those were fun days. They really were. And and sadly nowadays there's not as much fun in it. That's the whole thing we could talk about. That's right. The fact that radio is is pretty much voice tracked. You got guys who do ten shows around the country, and that's 
nine disc jockeys that don't have a job, don't and, have can't, a job? And, and then none of it's local very very little no, of it's right. local and nobody could get into it like i did that's right you know, you know nobody's teacher could recommend them to the radio station that's because that midnight to six job on a radio station is where you broke in the guys they got they worked on their act they got their chops together and that's right right that's I, the most important part that freedom to to experiment and yeah. and fail uh-huh. even. that's the farm club that is the farm club and i my first job at WJRD in my sophomore year, they said, we're going to let you do three to six. I said, man, they're going to put me on an afternoon drive in Tuscaloosa? No. 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And That's I, it. And I was happy to get it. Uh-huh. Plus we're the dollar thrilled. a nickel an hour or whatever they uh-huh, paid Whatever me. it was, yeah. <laughs> Tom, thanks so much. Uh, well, I enjoyed it. Tom Roberts, Crimson Tide Sports Network, coaches shows, University of Alabama sports and play-by-play and just a whole bunch of stuff. We need to have you back and we'll just we'll cover the rest of it okay. sometime. We'd be happy to. Take five shows, though. Thank you so much for listening or viewing. Remember, you can uh, always uh, catch this podcast uh, any place you get your podcast. The video is available on YouTube. Uh, the uh, 1819news.com, the folks who sponsor this, uh, this program, Uh, If you go to their website, it'll be there. And the uh, audio version is available for Spotify and uh, lots Uh, of... Apple Apple Apple, Podcasts, I'm sorry, Apple Podcasts. And if you like it, be sure to tell folks and subscribe and watch uh, some other great uplifting and exciting stories. Andrea Tice, thank you so much as always. It absolutely was a pleasure. So glad that you could come in, Tom. Andrea, I enjoyed it. And we'll see you next time on This Alabama Life.